Hey hey everyone, Felix from Nintendo Life here, and today we are finally here to review The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom for the Nintendo Switch. This review was written by the legendary Alana Hayes and converted into video by me. There's something truly magical about the first time you dive from the sky to the surface in Tears of the Kingdom. That one moment feels like a complete distillation of what made Breath of the Wild feel so special to many. The freedom, the thrill and the scope are all captured perfectly as you careen to the surface of Hyrule. You can see just how big the world is even before you land, reminding you of just how massive the previous game was. And somehow, Tears of the Kingdom does the impossible and makes Breath of the Wild feel like a proof of concept. It takes everything its predecessor does, improves upon every single aspect, and gives you even more freedom, an even bigger world, and tons more secrets to uncover. It's frankly staggering and makes for an absolutely incredible experience. Tears of the Kingdom is a sequel to Breath of the Wild in every sense of the word. The core of the game hasn't changed. The combat is largely the same, the surface map is, at first glance, identical, and even the structure starts off fairly similar. But even though Hyrule might seem familiar at first as you take your first steps across the grassy fields, you'll notice lots of little differences. There's a new town, new ruins, rock faces and cliffs look different, and there are dangers around every corner. There's just enough here to make looking around Hyrule a second time feel fresh, but it's also clear Nintendo has listened to some of the minor criticisms many had of the first game. For one, there's a more prevalent story this time around. We're not going to go into any detail here, but each domain feels much more involved in the overarching narrative, and new and returning characters all get moments to shine. Not every single objective follows the exact same pattern either. Sometimes you'll have to solve some riddles, while others you just need to follow a friend. But every single thread leads to something new and exciting, and sometimes to greater heights and depths than ever before. From side quests to the NPCs, and right down to the world itself, Tears of the Kingdom's Hyrule, despite being the same as Breath of the Wild's, feels much more lived in. The side quests are a lot more interesting with even more memorable characters, events, rewards, and there are long quest chains that also help you point you in the right direction for the story, such as hinting at where to find a missing item. We'd be remiss to spoil any, but rest assured that Terrytown is again home to one of the most rewarding of the bunch. The sky, where you start your adventure, feels completely different from the sprawling, exploration-encouraging world of the surface. Made up of a small collection of islands that are spread across a huge space, these house little puzzles and challenges. There's a real thrill to discovering a new island, whether it's just a treasure chest or a challenging mini-boss. But there's something the developers has been keeping close to its chest. A sprawling, dark underbelly hidden beneath Hyrule. While much more sparse than the surface, the depths challenges your navigation skills and survivability as you weave your way around extremely dangerous enemies and puddles of black and red sludge that inflicts gloom, a new status effect that temporarily reduces your maximum hearts. We're going to avoid the obvious from software comparison, but it's a nerve wracking experience and feels entirely unlike anything else in either this game or its predecessor. Visually, Tears of the Kingdom builds on Breath of the Wild's lovely art style, but with this sequel being built for the Switch alone, you can spot all the extra detail that's been painted onto the world. Mountains are much more detailed, and there's a wider variety of environments across the whole game, leading to some truly beautiful shots, particularly in the skies above Hyrule. Some of the music returns from Breath of the Wild, but we're delighted that there's tons of new songs and arrangements in the sequel, some of which are utterly gorgeous and brought a tear to our eyes. It made coming to this new, bigger version of Home that much more special.
Exploring any of these three maps is like opening multiple giant toy chests and figuring out what to do with your new tools to get there. Your four new abilities, Ultra Hand, Fuse, Ascend and Recall, crack open a world of possibilities in terms of combat, exploration and puzzle solving. Accidentally drop the platform you're trying to set in the air? Recall it. Can't climb up a cliff overhang? Ascend through it. Can't get over lava? Use Ultra Hand to make the most audacious Zelda-style monster truck ever. Or just stick together some slate and wheels and settle for that. In some ways, Hyrule is easier to get around than before, but those small changes that we hinted at earlier mean that there's often new problems to circumnavigate using your new toys. We found nothing more liberating than seeing something on the ground and knowing we can just fuse it to any of our unfused weapons, shields or arrows. And yes, you can hit your enemies with a beehive sword, and it's hilarious. Choo Choo Jelly is actually useful now, adding elemental properties to arrows, while the plethora of monster parts can increase your attack power tenfold. The possibilities are bursting at the seams at all times, but in a way that feels manageable. Of all the new abilities, Ultra Hand is the one you'll be using the most, and while it feels a little clunky for the first few hours, the game encourages you to practice enough that it soon becomes second nature. If you're not the most creative person, you don't need to worry, as you'll always find items lying around that hint at what you can build, or use the unlockable auto-build skill, which locks your previous creations and allows you to recreate them by using the necessary materials in front of you. You can go for simple solutions or the most elaborate builds to solve pretty much everything. Did we use Ultra Hand to stick a rocket to a Korok's backpack? Of course we did. It often feels like the sky's the limit in Tears of the Kingdom, although there are restrictions in place to stop things from feeling overwhelming. One thing that especially helps is that the game is generally a lot more challenging than Breath of the Wild. There's a lot more enemies on the map, often found in groups, and they're not shy about ganging up on you either. Many new enemies require brand new strategies to take down, and returning ones have stronger variations. And while weapon durability is back, monsters drop equipment so frequently that it felt even less of an issue here. We died a lot, especially at the beginning of the game, but we love that we had to think about our approach more carefully with each encounter. Fuse comes in handy to deal more damage or freeze other opponents as we try to take out the more dangerous ones. So even though the world is at our fingertips thanks to our new skills, the challenge tempers them and prevents them from becoming overpowered. A thing a lot of people will be happy to hear is that more traditional style dungeons make a return in Tears of the Kingdom. All of them are visually distinct with unique bosses and puzzles to solve, and they manage to blend the open nature of Breath of the Wild nicely with those classic multi-floor dungeons of the past. They're not quite the enclosed linear style of Ocarina of Time or Twilight Princess own per se, but they are a marked improvement over the Divine Beasts and just a lot of fun to get through. For those more bite-sized puzzles, well, shrines make a return too, but there's a lot more variety this time around. Combat shrines are largely gone and are instead replaced with either tutorial style ones that teach you how to utilize throwing items effectively or sneak attacks, or challenges that strip you of all your armor and weapons and force you to start from the basics and use your new skills to defeat some constructs. Some of the solutions really had us scratching our heads for a while, but if there's one thing Zelda nails for us, it's the satisfaction of progressing and understanding, even if sometimes our solution was just to build a giant bridge. The puzzles feel more organically integrated into the world as well. There are tons of cave systems in this game that house some rather unsettling enemies and or goodies, and these little networks can often feel like miniature dungeons. The sky is really one big puzzle because it makes you think about how to progress or get around, but there's also little challenges that unlock new shrines or that encourage you to create solutions to defeating some of the new overworld bosses. Honestly, we couldn't get enough of traveling between all three maps. Our curiosity felt us in the underground multiple times as we tried to take on harder enemies, but as we got stronger and accustomed to the harsh world below, that satisfaction of finally taking down a monster was thrilling. The contrast between the sky, surface and depth is really refreshing, with all three bringing different styles of gameplay, visuals and music to the table, but they never feel detached from one another.
and all three maps are seamless. There are no load times as you jump from the surface to the depths, or as you shoot yourself from the surface to the sky. Given this, it's evident that Tears of the Kingdom is pushing the system to its limits. The frame rate is capped at 30 FPS, both handheld and docked, and for the most part, the game stays around or just below that. But during elaborate ultra hand builds or busy fights and locations, performance can dip into the low 20s or even lower fairly frequent. It's not hugely disruptive and didn't feel any worse than Breath of the Wild, particularly after Nintendo released a pre-launch patch during the review period, but it serves as a staunch reminder of the now 6-year-old console's limitations. Still, it's pretty impressive that this entire world has been squeezed onto a little Switch cartridge, and those performance issues didn't affect our enjoyment at all. Whether we were standing on an island high in the sky gazing down through the clouds as the sun sets across Hyrule, or plummeting through those skies as the blood moon rose, we just fell in love with the open world of Hyrule all over again. So, is Tears of the Kingdom better than Breath of the Wild? Well, that'll be down to personal preference, but we can guarantee that you'll adore this if you loved its predecessor. Tears of the Kingdom recaptures that magic in new and exciting ways, while improving upon and polishing almost every facet. This is an enormous, breathtaking sequel, and a very, very special video game. So in conclusion, it's impossible to talk about everything that makes Tears of the Kingdom so incredible, and making many of those discoveries yourself is part of the magic. It's also impossible to overstate just how much there is to do in Hyrule this time around. Much like its predecessor, this is your playground for the next however many years to come, with a little sprinkling of that older Zelda fairy dust mixed into Breath of the Wild's formula. It's a glorious, triumphant sequel to one of the best video games of all time. We can't wait to see what the world will do with this game. So that's the reason why we're giving The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom for the Nintendo Switch a resounding 10 out of 10. If you like this video, why don't you soar from the sky all the way into the depths of Hyrule and click that subscribe button. And don't forget to check out our website nintendolove.com where you can find reviews like these in written form. Stay safe, play some Zelda Tears of the Kingdom and we'll see you in the next one. Felix from Nintendo Life, out. Oh, wow.